On this installment of Creative Cabin, I have the wonderful Luke Wooderson. Now, currently, Luke is actually in Germany, which is super exciting because once again, we get to travel. He is originally from Belfast, which is also super exciting because he's got this adorable, sexy accent. Hey, Luke. How are you? I'm doing okay. How are you? Very well. Thank you for asking. <laughs> <laughs> So you're quite the fan of traveling and that's how you ended up in Germany. So obviously right now, I assume that you're missing traveling, but you're probably also at the same time missing home. How does that feel? To me, that feels uh, quite mixed. I like, I like traveling, as you say, and I enjoy being in other countries. Um, but sometimes I get messages from family and friends like, oh, are you coming back? You know, and I, I, I keep up with them. I do Zoom chats. I, I catch up with them that way or I uh, send recordings or messages, whatever. So um, I do miss uh, having to walk around the wee areas where I was brought up or, or, or going to anywhere uh, in some of the other countries I've been to and just seeing the memories. So, But um, I'm enjoying this in the moment, this experience of having right now being here in Germany. There's so much to see and do. Yeah. Yeah. And you've got snow there right now. And I'm so oh, jealous. Like, like the snow here is lovely. Really nice snow here. Yeah. Yeah. It's really fluffy. It's like flower. Like, it's really nice. Sorry. I miss snow. Um, anyone who knows me knows that I haven't seen my parents uh, in two years. I haven't gone back to Switzerland in almost a decade. And right now I miss snow in like unimaginable ways because I had no intention of traveling this year anyway. But now I definitely can. So you're just like extra, you know. I know. Like uh, apparently in Leipzig, it never snows. This is where I am. And uh, they haven't snow here for something like two, three years, I got told. And then it just, we had a snowstorm. It was crazy. There was lightning, thunder, and all this snow just came out of nowhere. And we had it for like two to three days, I think. I, we still have some. So, and apparently it might snow again tonight, but we don't know. Can I make a crazy request? Can you send me videos on my Instagram for my own personal use, please? Yeah, I'll send you some snow on Instagram. <laughs> I can't send it by post, it'll melt, but definitely yeah. on, on, <laughs> on Instagram, maybe in an ice box. Thank you. You're, you're very welcome. That actually made me sad. I'll, I'll send you a snowman. I'll make one and I'll put it in a little ice box. That's the most adorable idea that ever existed. Thank you. Now, obviously, obviously, you came uh, to my attention back in December because you released a song this year. Well, you released a song last year, but this has been the longest decade of my life. Um, <laughs> so Cold and Dry is just out. Um, what does it feel like for you to release in lockdown? For me in lockdown, um, I didn't even actually think about that. Like this song, I was actually very nervous to release in the first place because this song is very, if people have heard me play and sing, it's not like the rest of my stuff at all. This song is very slow, it's like a ballad, and it's a bit uh, diverse compared to the rest of my stuff. Um, but uh, the guy that recorded me and produced the song and helped it make it happen, he uh, was really like, man, this song's beautiful, really release it seriously. And it's a great time of year to release it, you know? Uh, it works with the name, works with the, the, the emotions, and people being indoors would definitely sit and relax and listen to his song. So uh, I was like, yes. I'm on board. This is a nice kind of song I enjoy playing and singing. And uh, I think when we recorded it, we really captured the meaning of the song, especially the way um, I sing and play. Really expressive. And that's very important in my music is really putting your heart out in, in the songs that you mean. Um, so I was like, OK, let's do this. Let's, let's release it. Make it happen. Yeah. That's amazing, because like, Actually, one of the questions I'm working towards getting the courage to ask, I, I realize I can ask it to you because of the, the answer you just gave. So like I noticed that a lot of artists, when they finally make it big, it'll usually be for a song that they really don't even like that much of their own. Right. So you just said that this is not normally your style and something that you wouldn't have done if it wasn't for your producer's push. And I think that's incredible because we should listen to the people around us because they help formulate our music and they understand other things that we can see in ourselves. But if you were to pick your favorite song that you ever wrote, what would it be and why? Mm, 
that's a very good question. It changes quite a lot. Um, I think sometimes uh, when I read a song that means something so much to me right now in the moment, sometimes that ends up being my favorite. Um, this song usually comes back and forth to me. And a lot of people have asked me to record it quite a lot. And I really enjoy playing this one. Um, it's called Fox and the Hind. And it's a, I, I just made it a, a, like a kind of story up. I was watching Alice in Wonderland. And it's basically like a murder, Cluedo mystery, Bonnie and Clyde song with Alice and the White Rabbit. And like the Queen of Hearts and their cards are trying to find these people. And uh, there's like the fox and the hind is like uh, the patrol or whatever. So I kind of wrote this bluesy, rockish, kind of like Fleetwood Mac kind of song. Um, and uh, every time I play it live, people are always come up to me going, oh man, you playing fox and the hind tonight? Are you playing it? Uh, uh, are you going to record it? Please record it, man. You know, and um, I, I always comes back. And I think I personally like really like playing it too, um, because my singing, I really like to express my singing very much. And I was influenced by like Ray Charles and like Kurt Cobain, uh, because they really, when they sing something, they felt like they meant it. Every word was 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 meant. And when I sing something, I mean it. And the lyrics that are used in that really push the the boundaries. I think. To my, to my, to who I am as an artist. So I think it captures me. Yeah. So I think Fox and the Hound would be one of them, definitely. And from that very brief description, I truly wish you recorded someday so that I may actually be able to also immerse myself in the wonderland that is Alice and the Rabbit on a murder mystery tour. <laughs> it's crazy, but uh, that's the best people are crazy, I suppose, huh? No, at the beginning of our interview, you asked me, um, why do I do what I do? And I quoted the fact that I fell in love with a song 12 years ago. I'll pass that song on to you uh, later. But the song in particular, I'll talk about at length in a different interview. So I don't want to give too much away. But it also has a themology surrounding Alice in Wonderland. And what it did do was send me down a rabbit hole, which is the Irish music industry. Therefore, I see a lot of power behind that metaphorical use of an existing powerful story. Mm -hmm. Yes, like uh, one of the lyrics is uh, run away now, Alice, down the rabbit hole. And uh, it's near the end of the song, but I can uh, repeat it and it gets louder and louder and more, you know, very rockish at the end. And it really... Um, it sounds like an anthem near the end of the song. It starts off not like an anthem. It sounds kind of dancey. Then it turns into this rockish kind of thrashy feel. And um, yeah, I'm, I'm interested to check this song you're talking about. Definitely send me it because if that was a song that inspired you, I definitely, definitely want to hear it because uh, I love being inspired. Yeah, once upon a song, I got so inspired that I decided this is what I wanted to do forever. That's fantastic to hear. And I will send it on. <laughs> yes, definitely, definitely do. I'd be up for definitely hearing it. It's kind of an embarrassing thing. I've had artists go to me, there's no way a song can impact your life that much. And I was like, well, why are we making music then? Because Definitely, I agree. I think it starts somewhere, right? And for me, it was in the kitchen, my mother cooking, her radio was on and she was listening to some songs. One song caught my ear and I was just, that was me. I just wanted to try and learn guitar after that. You know, so really? definitely, yeah. Now that's a question I haven't asked in a while in my interviews, but it's an old school question I used to use. And it is, what was the first song you fell in love with? Because I believe it's your gateway drug into the rock and roll music industry. My song for the rock and roll industry. Um, two come to mind. One of mine was Finn Lizzy. I loved, um, I think for me, I really, really liked uh, boys and ba boys is back in town, isn't it? The boys are back in town. When I heard them when I was like five years old, um, first time hearing Finn Lizzy, that really blew me up. Like I, I loved it and I put it on repeat. Um, I think Queen is up there for me as well. I really liked Freddie Mercury and I really liked this song. Um, it was on the Greatest Hits album, funny enough. I think it was Another One Bites the Dust. I really love the bass riff and I love the way the drums and the singing and the guitar 
is all like structured a certain way. Like the other songs aren't like that. And I really like that. Um, I think the first rock song I ever heard that really got me was probably All Right Now by Free. I really like that song. Yeah, that's a good song. Yeah. Just yeah. proud of rock. <laughs> but I listen to all types, so it's all good. Yeah, no, and that's amazing. So, like, now that we've gone through your, like, initial music memories, uh, I'm kind of interested in gig memories because I think people are missing live music very, very much in Almo. We have all these incredibly interesting platforms developing that are allowing us to submerge ourselves in venues. It's very hard to truly remember what a gig is unless we talk about them, and we should talk about them at length. So what are your best gig memories, either ones you performed at or ones that you were attending? One of my first gig memories um, for me, I think was probably one of the first times I've had um, an experience where I think made me a songwriter this way. And it was in a local pub um, called the Ivy Bar, I think it was called. And funny enough, I think you might know him. There's a guy called Sam Wickens and uh, he wasn't there, but he was a local in the area at the time. I think we're both from the same area, um, but he's fantastic. Um, I was trying to stuff it. Anyway, um, I played one of my songs in there and I was 16, when I, or no, 17 when I wrote my song. And I had this line that was quite repetitive, but it was a bit punkish and a bit uh, grungy. And I was listening to a lot of like Nirvana and uh, Soundgarden and stuff at the time. And the whole group of people in the room sang my own lyrics back. And I was only 17 and I didn't do anything. I was nowhere near the mic. People were just, just got it, just understood. And to me, I had control. I felt like I had the crowd in my hands and it felt like heaven, really. And uh, for me, that made me want to continue doing songwriting. I was like, okay, if I can do this at 17, then I think I can do this for a living, you know, and inspire people, make people connect and fall in love and, that's what it's all about. I think that's why I do music. I want to act like a doctor, kind of make people feel not worried about their lives and enjoy that moment. I think it's very important. You know? Yeah, it is incredibly important and it's a beautiful superpower to have uh, when I don't possess. <laughs> yeah, but... I can't believe it. I really can. It's mind blowing when it happened to me. Um, so I think for a gig memory of me performing, probably one of my earliest ones, definitely. Yes, that got me kind of at the point where I wanted to do it. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> that was a cool experience. Yeah, you're um, right. And music does have such a connection power. So like music I, is a connector. And then depending on your own belief system, like it connects us. Like it's the only time you'll ever have like four bankers, a metalhead, um, a drunk guy all connect for the same reason, right? Because they're not going to have conversations outside of this gig, but in this moment in time, they are completely to the mercy of the healing sounds that are going on around them. And there's something majestic yeah. and beautiful about that. Yeah, it's so beautiful. Yeah. I think for me, yeah, I, I totally understand what you're saying. Yeah. Yeah. Ah, mind blown. I think another gig memory I can think of. I think was in <clears throat> Edinburgh and it was at the Fringe Festival. Uh, I lived in Edinburgh for about five years. So I used to do the Fringe Festival every year because um, I uh, got to know more and more artists and they brought me to the right people and, and they got to hear me and wanted me to play at some of their venues. So it was, it was a great way to connect and get to know everybody. And uh, this is like a festival where you can just do just original music. So you can do covers, but a lot of people try to um, persuade you to be yourself and do your own stuff as well don't be afraid to show your stuff you know that's what it is it's art you know that kind of thing so one time I played in a cow gate near grass market and it was called cow shed and they have a lot of um, different venues for comedians and actors and actresses and music and I was in this huge cow shed where it's just music and I was getting on stage I was about to play I think I performed about in front of it was a really fully packed place and it was the middle of the night. I think it was 500 people on the place, fully packed. It was just me and my guitar, no band, just me. And um, oh, people were dancing, people went nuts, people were drinking cups in the air, way really enjoying the moment. And um, 
hear my own music and, and really liking it, you know, not just like, oh, I don't know this song, you know, they really, really enjoyed the, the moment and just being out to have a bit of crack and a bit of a party and enjoy themselves. And for me, that was that was also an amazing experience that I'll never forget, I think. Yeah. Sponsored by Tenants. <laughs> the Scottish beer. <laughs> yeah, it was quite interesting. But the, yeah, I think for me, those two gig memories are definitely a pinnacle for me, um, for my own experience of being a musician. I think I'll mention two gig experiences I had that were the best for me as not me playing, but seeing other artists. One of them I really liked was in Amsterdam. I was at this place called Milkway. And um, it was a band called The Villagers, and they're from Ireland as well. And they released an album, and I really love this song called Trick of the Light. Have you heard it? No. Oh, what? You go and listen to them. You really like them. Definitely. Um, their whole album's brilliant, but Trick of the Light is an amazing bass groove. Uh, uh, it's really funky and folkish. I really like it. So I saw them, and seeing that in Amsterdam, in that beautiful city with all the towns and alleyways and stuff, and, and, and going to see a, a, such a beautiful band play in that venue was just fantastic. And the atmosphere was just, everyone was so quiet when they were on stage. And that never really happens. People like to jump and read. But when they went on, everyone was just like, jaws dropped, just silence. Everyone cheering at the end and one drinks with them and stuff. It was fantastic. And then my last one, I think for me, was probably the best band I ever saw live. And I think it's Foo Fighters. I saw Dave Grohl live and that blew me away. And they played in, I think it was in Belfast and I was with, who was I with? I think it was with a few mates anyway. <laughs> we were kind of drunk. Uh, <laughs> but uh, Dave Grohl came out on stage and he played probably my favorite song of the Waste Night album, which is White Limo. I really loved that song. I thought it was very raw and dirty and I liked that. And uh, I was just overwhelmed seeing a hero of mine on stage as well and playing. He was only meant to play for like three hours. They played for six. They played almost twice as long because he wanted the, the people to enjoy the music. And I, I like him very much because he didn't study music. He just did it. You know, he, he loved music. And um, I was the same when I first started. I studied eventually, but at the time I self-taught and got low tints and hips here and there and listen to a lot of music because I wanted to really learn these songs, you know. So uh, seeing someone that had a similar mindset to me, I thought was quite cool. Yeah. And wow. Really great front man. Yeah. Yeah, he's my son's hero as well. <clears throat> oh, yeah. yeah. He's a great guy. Great guy. Definitely. A very lucky man too, but also very, very hard very working. Talented. Very talented. Yeah. I mean, I love his drumming like Oh, man. And my son wants to be a singing drummer so he gets most of his inspiration from Dave Grohl oh I, yeah nice that's nice isn't the, I don't know much about the Eagles but isn't their drummer a singer as well there's a few singing drummers actually it's one of the uh, rarer instruments to sing along with because it's actually very hard to sing in a melody while upkeeping a beat right this logic so yeah like doing 70 at timing you know <laughs> But yeah, that's what my son wants to do. He wants to be a singing drummer. He's four years old. Your son's going to be a legend. Your son's going to be a legend. I'll go and see his gigs. Thank you. <laughs> I bring him to a lot of gigs. So once I can, I'll also bring him to one of yours. Oh, that maybe. must be amazing for your wee kid. Like, to see gigs, like, oh, that's lovely. He takes it for granted, though. So oh, I, uh... it's, it's his reality. Like, he thinks all children go to gigs. He thinks all children's moms are on the radio. He thinks all children's moms do things like this. So. <laughs> oh. Oh, you're gonna look like a god when you're old, when he's older. Oh, he's like, he's gonna be like twenty. And he's just gonna be like, yeah, just, I'm not worthy. I'm not worthy. <laughs> I doubt that very much because I, I, yeah. Look, we'll see. Um, but kids we'll see. <laughs> don't see. Do you know what I mean? They don't usually see like uh, the, the qualities in their parents in the moment. Like maybe mm. when he's in his forties, he'll look back at this and he'll be like. This is cool. I still can watch her interviews and she actually did a lot. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Do you know? 
Yeah, that's that's yeah, it's kind of like a time capsule for him as well. Every single one of these. That's kind of a cool thought. Actually, I never thought of that. Yeah, it's something I think we all go through. You know, there's something about your parents that you appreciate more when you get older and you're like, wow, I was quite lucky. You know, uh, I remember for me, for, for music, for example, you know, like I had an opportunity to do music and uh, my mother was very um, wanting me to do something I love doing. And she, I think she must have seen some potential <laughs> when I was a kid, you know, um, and she was just like, go for it, kid. You know, I think you got this. Good. Yes. So uh, my mother helped a lot when I was doing music and bought my guitar and uh, helped me out big time with all that stuff. Yeah, it's nice. Yeah, I think that's all you want as a parent is your child to find happiness. I think everything else yeah. is really not important. But um, I feel when you get older and you're on your own and you start traveling and all this stuff, you realize how lucky you had people so supportive helping you and it makes you realize that they're heroes or they become heroes of yours as well. So it's nice to have that, I think. Even friends, it doesn't have to be family, it be friends, relatives, others, you know. Yeah. There's always yeah. somebody there, you know. My parents watch all of my interviews. Um, so uh, I've never oh, given that, them a shout that's, out. That's actually. adorable. That's adorable. But since they can't see me, they still can see me. So uh, my mom and dad watch these every time they go up straight away and then send me. Actually, in secret, they send me a review of the artist because not only do they watch my interview and enjoy everyone I'm talking to, they also go find the song and understand why I was speaking to that person and send me this little mini, mini review. Oh, that's really lovely. That's really nice. Oh, my goodness. That's really lovely. Really, that's that's really nice. Oh my God, that's really beautiful. Yeah, it's really oh, cool. My... And yeah. <laughs> yeah, like they're going to be reviewing everything on each song. That's nice. Me and my father, we have cooking competitions. <laughs> so like I'll cook something. And every day I made a mushroom risotto. I, I try to make different foods and uh, keep myself busy because I, I like, I love cooking. So uh, I work in the kitchen a lot and I meet chefs that hate cooking. They don't cook when they go home. They just kind of cook at work. I like to do it all the time. I like home food it's very much. So I made this mushroom risotto and I sent it to my family. It's like, um, this is what I'm having today. And then um, my father, he was sent a, a picture back of his risotto. <laughs> and then it'd be so on and so forth. I'll make something, then he'll make it, you know, and I noticed that. But we don't like, we don't like uh, competitive. We're not competitive. We just kind of support each other cooking. My dad's the same. He loves cooking. As well, so I think we got it from each other. <laughs> I think competition is very healthy. So this kind of competition that you have with your dad is actually quite healthy because it is pushing nice. both it's of lovely. you to be better. Like you know. Oh, we used to do running. We used to do marathons and all too. We used to. We, uh, my goodness, yeah, yeah. My dad, my dad's a sportsman. As uh, so am I sometimes. I miss it. I used to do boxing. I really liked it, and uh, I used to do a lot of running with him. So we used to run and do all these. Um, miles and miles and miles runs. But Terry, me now, I like after train again. <laughs> there you go. There's something you don't really expect that often as a musician who actually really enjoys sport as well. It's it's like it's a preconceived notion in people's heads. They were like, it doesn't matter that you it's know. It's hard this... to balance it. To be fair, like as you're like in your creative center, and then you have to try and balance, try and stay fit. You know, but sometimes you're sitting in a chair for so long. And your it goes like this, right? And you're like, oh, maybe I'll take a break from music and go running or do training or something. Yeah. It's good. I think exercise is very good. It really makes me think better. I think I have a better mindset. So when I come back, I feel like a breath of fresh air. And uh, I try to sing melodies. Maybe I can hit the notes quite often. For example, I think uh, running helps your diaphragm big time. Uh, so you can hit higher falsettos or whatever, you know. Hmm. <laughs> that is interesting though because singing has to do with endurance so like i was checking else... freddie mercury out and uh, when i was checking the documentary about him he he did a lot of exercise like he smoked a lot but he, he he did a lot of breathing exercises and he ran a lot as well and exercised so much and uh, i think that's what made him last so well hitting those notes on stage i was checking chester bennington and he was to see him constantly training his voice and for the age he was to still do that is very insane like most people can only stay doing that in their 20s where he was still doing it like right up to his 40s like it's crazy it's crazy yeah 
No, it's true. Like these are things that people take for granted, but it takes an incredible amount of devotion, dedication and hard work in order Absolutely. to maintain a career that long. Yeah. I think I hear sirens. <laughs> Do you hear them? No, we're okay. Oop, oop, it's the sound of the... The Germans? <laughs> <laughs> The, the police, I mean, yeah. <laughs> now nah, the microphone's not picking it up, so you're absolutely fine. Well, it's, it's actually a fire truck. It's a school <laughs> they, they do. Uh, we live near a fire station. Well, it's a bit of a road, but they do a patrol, and they always start off by going out with their sirens every, I think, three to four hours. Yeah. Yeah, so we were talking about this in the pre-interview stage and uh, I have interviewed people in different countries already, but I don't know what Germany is like at the moment. Can you describe what Germany is like at the moment for anyone who's in Ireland? Wondering? Yeah, yeah. Uh, Germany is actually doing all right uh, for, for, for the whole lockdown at the moment. Like the people really listen to the news. So when something happens, people stick to it. Um, they're really strict. Um, and uh, there's a lot of police patrols, so you you really have to have a good reason why you're going out. And in most areas, especially in the centre of Leipzig, you have to wear a mask at all times. You, you're not allowed to walk around just the park without a mask. Even in the parks, there's parts you have to have a mask on too. Um, um, but if you're near your local neighbourhood, you can take your mask off. But if you're like going into the city or train stations and stuff like that, Masks always on. Um, they don't have any shops open at all. I think there's takeaway foods, but that's even strict as well. <laughs> you know, I don't think we're like takeaways anymore. Um, they have to be delivered to your door if you're going to order food. But I think that's all. There's retail there's shops open if you need to grab bread or butter or milk or something. But the rest of it's all closed now. Like, yeah, yeah. Um, people still go to work, but it's mostly people work at home now. Yeah, yeah, very strict. But yeah. but uh, they they they're uh, they're very nice people. Like um, uh, though they don't have patience for driving. <laughs> That's the only thing um, I I've noticed. Like I I've never seen it was scary. Um, I was crossing this road, and I got to the other side, and the lights were still uh, uh, green for crossing, but they're red for the other side, and. Three cars uh, went through these red lights at like 70, 80 kilometers on like a 40 kilometer road. It was crazy. And that happens quite a lot. Uh, people don't like to wait. They have to go, 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 you know, they need to be somewhere. It's just crazy. They can't wait for like five seconds, even, you know, it's like they, they need to be somewhere and they stick to that plan, you know, it's, it's interesting, it's interesting. Uh, I haven't seen that much like that in other countries like that. But I heard Italy is quite like that as well. So uh, I've been to Italy once. I need to go there again. I just ate. That's all I did was eat food. Yeah. A lot of food. Put it on by two free stone. You'd think that, but I've only ever lost weight over there because of the quality of the food. So Oh, I... the quality is unbelievable. <clears throat> it's actually quite good quality here in Germany too, I have to say. Um, but not not really... Their veg is good, but and their tomatoes are good. But when it comes to potatoes and stuff, they're really tiny. They're like this size, you know. Uh, that's one thing I miss actually about Ireland uh, is the potatoes are good, especially on local farms. I used to go to a local farm uh, to try and pick uh, potatoes and stuff, and they do really good stuff, you know. And they're like this size, you know, like baked potatoes. I mash them. Yeah. Here's potatoes are a lot smaller. You know, definitely. <laughs> yeah, they're more like salad potatoes because that's kind of what. Yeah, they're like baby for. potatoes or something. You know, they're not the they're not the biggest size. If you got one big one, out, you're lucky. Yeah, you know, yeah. you think it's a bonus. <laughs> um. So I had two questions surrounding then uh, traveling. Uh, the first question would be, obviously, you've been to so many places. I work on the theory that every single one of us every day is actually compiling the soundtrack to their lives. And I actually would urge anyone at home to actually write the soundtrack of their life down and just compartmentalize moments, people, whatever. But with that 
working theory of mine, I was wondering if there's any songs you associate with places, whether they're songs you've written yourself or songs you heard in the places while you were there. That I think was when I started traveling, that was one of the first things I wanted to do was, um, I think every song you write has a reason. I think there has to be a reason behind it, especially for a singer songwriter. I think you have, if you're a singer and you're a songwriter, you, you want to express the best you can, I think. Uh, and make people feel relatable, like they can relate to you in that way, but not just in one spot, but around the world, you know. And um, I wrote a song called Graffiti, and it's literally about graffiti. It is, uh, it's like a funk, funky kind of song. And um, I got words from toilets, from pubs, from streets, from alleyways, and I went to it was in Ireland, it was in Scotland, it was in England, it was in Jordan. I got lyrics from Jordan, I got lyrics from Greece, I got lyrics from Italy, I got lyrics from Germany. And I just kind of, anyway, I went to all these places and I put them all together and I wrote the song with the lyrics. And the thing that I find quite interesting is when people relate uh, that way, the, the words are all very similar in every area. So one of the first lines I wrote in the song uh, was, uh, call me for a good time, here's my number, <laughs> which is in most toilets or pubs or bars. And I find it interesting that every other place around the world, if it's in an Italian or if it's in Arabic or what, it's the same thing. <laughs> like I was asking somebody uh, in Jordan, I was like, what's this say <laughs> in, the, in, the, in the street, this guy? And he was just like, oh, it says, call me for a good time. Oh, I said, oh, okay. <laughs> So I kind of just I find that interesting that um, a lot of people write very similar, not just like that, by the way, but in different ways and in and, and, and other countries. So we're kind of all relatable in some way, you know, and I like that. I like that as well. And it's fun, you know, it's a it's a fun kind of song. So everyone's having a good time. We can connect that way, you know, and I like that. Yeah. So that's 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 one song that I feel is like uh, is graffiti. So I wanted to challenge myself and do something very different. And I went that direction. I thought maybe the people can say the words, not me, you know? Uh, so I did it that way. Yeah, that's that's one way. Yeah, so. That's an incredible story. I love that creative process. I love the fact that every single word is written by somebody else. I love the fact that they actually relate to several different locations as opposed to my original question, which really right now means nothing because the answer is just too, too interesting. Like, so like, I find that fascinating. I love it. I cannot wait to hear it. You're going to have to figure out a way to send it to me. Yes, but... that's, that's another one I've been asked to record as well. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. There's just not enough errors for all the recording. So, yeah, let's move on to the creative process. Uh, okay. I am interested, obviously, you know, extra, extra interested because of that, that information. But this moment in time has been difficult for many people. Have you yeah. noted any personal creative changes or aspects of your creativity that have been different these days? Yes, um, I think for most for me anyway, not most, I don't know if it's everybody for every songwriting process, everyone has a different way of doing it. But for me, uh, when I write a song, I base it on something that I've experienced uh, in the moment, or actually sometimes I write a song that's about someone else's experience that I might know and kind of do a tribute to that person, good or bad or whatever. So it could be a good song, a happy song, but based on someone I may have known or met that were very happy in that moment. And it was just a nice way to ins be inspired and write a song that way. But I think when I was in lockdown here, last year when the first lockdown happened, I lost my job and um, I was alone and I had no internet, I had no TV. I had, it was just me. And uh, I, had, uh, I had to pay rent and I had to busk on the streets to just get food for dinner every night, that kind of stuff. Uh, that not all the time I've been okay here and there with the food, but it got to the point of stack close, you know. And then um, I think I'm kind of happy for it as well. I'm not upset about it. I think um, for me, it made me a better person. Maybe realize uh, how grateful I am for the stuff I have around me. 
I'm not worrying about like having like 20 or 30 guitars or even a laptop, you know? Uh, so I wrote a song called Six Feet Tall. And it's all about when I was going through that struggle, like busking on the streets, um, trying to stay in contact with friends, going to coffee shops just to use Wi-Fi so I can try and find a job, you know, those kind of things. And I think when you're in the moment and you're struggling, I feel like there's going to be other people that are going to relate to that or find that powerful. And when I sing it and play it, it takes me all the way back to when it happened. And then I'm in that moment and I think that I can express myself the best way to the people I can. And, and, and maybe people can relate or not, but they might find it beautiful in some way or form, I think, you know? So it's kind of like telling a story of your life, you know, and I think it's important um, to do so. I think so. So for me, when I wrote that, um, I think it was important to express the moment you're in when you write uh, a song like that. Um, and yeah, it was, I was very driven and very passionate and very expressive and so happy I finished the song. Um, and then I showed it to people and people were like, um, the, 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 the lyrics even, they were like, wow, I would have never expressed that way of my words with the lyrics, you know, and they find that quite inspiring. And inspire, I have inspired other people to write somewhere. You know, it's really nice that, to, to hear that back, you know, so. Yeah, um, that would be one of my ways that I would work would be through my own personal experiences. Um, I also like to, um, sometimes I'll play a riff and I'll make up some words and I'll go, yeah, that works. That's quite good, you know. Uh, like I'm writing a song uh, and it's uh, not nowhere near finished. And uh, one of the lines is um, baked in a house made of gingerbread, lying down on my lemon drizzled bed. And it's just all about being hungry or having the munchies or something. And, uh, you know, it makes me feel happy just writing something so similar. I listen to a lot of Beatles. Uh, I was listening to Lucy in the Sky with Diamonds. And I realized he says, like, picture yourself in a boat in a river you know, with like foods around them and stuff. And it makes you think that way as well, you know. So um, sometimes my uh, creativity comes from listening to songs or, or moments where I'm hungry or moments where I want to dance or just in the moments, but it's always about me somehow. But I want to also be about the people. So I think about that too. I don't try to think about myself at all. I try to think about around the scenario and think that other people can probably relate to me, you know, in that way. You know, but yeah, that's, that's my process. That's a really interesting process. And I like that it hits loads of different things because a lot of people get kind of pigeonholed in a genre or in a style mm -hmm. that they feel suits them and they never really stray very far, but you naturally gravitate to more complex. Yes, um, I had a lot of help from a friend actually. When I was living in Scotland, I lived with this guy. He's from England, but he loved Edinburgh. And um, he listened to a lot of my songs. And he said he liked my songs. He says it's all one thing. It's like when you hear it, you know it's you. And that's not a bad thing. But he says, I feel like you've got more potential to be diverse, is what he said. So uh, at the time, I wasn't sure where he was going with this. And I wasn't sure. How he, I'm not uh, I'm not very crit Like, I like critics. So I don't mind people being critical. I like that. I like to be an open box. Um, um, so I said, okay, so I wrote some funky music. I wrote a rap song once, um, I wrote some dance songs, bluesy songs, jazzy kind of songs. You know, I try to split it really diverse. And with the next song that I'm recording at the moment, people are gonna be like, whoa, because cold and dry, and then they're gonna hear this new song. And this song is completely different. So they're gonna be like, that's a, that's a huge jump, you know? Like, uh, so uh, yeah, I like to be diverse. I really, I think it's like David Bowie, you know, he, he, he was very diverse when he was doing stuff. He would be a different character on stage every time and there'd be different music for each, each decade, you know? Mm -hmm. And uh, I like that about him. And I kind of want to be the same. I don't want to be written as one genre, you know? It's nice to be diverse, especially because you have more control of what you want creativity wise, because if you release an album, and every song is different. 
then the fans and the friends or the family are going to not expect what's next. And that's a good thing. Because like, for example, Green Day, you're going to expect punk music to be the next album. But what if they decide to do classical? You know, because it will be different. We don't know that, but they, they lose that that freedom of to do whatever. And it's really tough. Yeah. So I'm trying to do it now while I can. <laughs> and then, you know, hopefully I can still continue to do that and inspire people that way. Yeah, no, that's fascinating. I think that's wonderful because in a sense, you're still finding your feet and you're still having your creative process. Maybe one day you find a voice that you no longer want to change. Maybe you find exactly the style that is you. But in the meantime, like, for, like, for instance, how often I color my hair, like, do you know what I mean? I think artists should have the same variety available to them and how yeah. they wish to create. You know what I mean? Yeah. I think Elton John's like that too, isn't he? He always changed his style and looks every time. His uh, pair of shoes even, you know. <laughs> so yeah, it's interesting, isn't it? Yeah. But I like so, that. But I like that very much. There's so many ways to do it. But I, I like I like this and I'm thinking I'm really excited for the next one already and I really like the first one. So, you know, other people are going to react the same. And as well, you're kind of grasping at a wider audience because if you're doing something completely different, like maybe the people who like the first song won't like this, but then you might get new people and then you're kind of it's smart. Yeah, yeah. Like um, it's good to get, I think, new fans. I just want to make sure that, you know, that they also enjoy the music. I hope it's just not like, you know, I don't know uh, how to describe it. Like, you know, what you have, like, Cold and Dry is like a soft ballad. And then the next one is, like, I'll say the name. It's called Tiny Little Ghost. And it's um, it's about, like, having a conscience on each shoulder, the good and the bad, right? And uh, it's like a spooky, Halloween-y, rockish, bluesy, um, gothic kind of feel. And um, it, it's got really cool lyrics and we're experimenting at the moment with like skeleton noises and ghost sounds in the song. So it's like, I mean, compared to Cold the Dry, it's going to be a big jump. And um, I think for them, it's going to be a surprise uh, to the fans and friends and family to hear. Uh, and I think, I think it will make a bigger bass, I think, this song. It's definitely something you, you you definitely sit and chill and nod your head to, I think. Because um, when I'm with my producer, he's also doing it every time. And I'm like, if he's doing it, then maybe other people will. <laughs> Absolutely. He's basically your grey whistle test until anyone else hears it. And then you'll know. Then you'll know. I've had good results so far. Like, um, it's nowhere near done. But it is slowly, gradually getting there. Um, but uh, so far, anyone that has heard it, it's all... I was really surprised. It was really, really good results, like in a good surprise way, you know. I was surprised to to hear that people, even though it's such a rough version, people are still gonna like it already, you know. It's a good sign. It's a really nice sign so far. So I'm chuffed, very chuffed about it. it sounds very promising, and it must be nice to having a, like a producer that you gel so well with. So, yes. How did you meet your producer? Uh, actually, how did I meet him? I was actually originally recording with a guy and he was from East Timble and he lived here in Leipzig and we're recording in his studio, but he had to travel somewhere, I think for work. So he gave my music to this other person, which was a guy from Israel. And um, he heard the ideas and he really liked them. And he wanted to add a bit of uh, sugar and spice to the ingredients, things I would have never thought of that works so well the song. And we start instantly gelling that way. So it was from another recording artist. So he sent my stuff to this guy. I met this person. He's also a musician in Leipzig as well. Um, and he's just fantastic the way he thinks and does things and records. And he tries to keep it interesting. He doesn't want to be repetitive. He wants there to be something different comes in this way or we pan it this way. And let's add this noise in here. And, you know, I love that working with him. It was all by accident, you know. I met him by accident. And uh, he heard potential in my music and he really wanted to see where I can go with this. And he, we've we've built a really good friendship. When I uh, try to uh, meet up here and there, if we can, you know, during this lockdown and, uh, have a beer or a, a 
food together or something, you know. So it, it's it's nice. It's nice. It's nice. Yeah. I only just got to know him properly for about I think two three months. So yeah, early process, but but they're a good one. Very good. Yeah, I find that fascinating. A lot of people don't like know much about like how do you meet a producer and stuff like that. So I try to ask that question because it turns out most of the time it's an organic unplanned thing. Very seldom do you actually go searching for a producer. A producer finds you when you're ready. I think that's just. That's what I'm with a guy um, from Istanbul. He saw me and he heard my music and he really liked what I was doing. And he was like, man, I really want to record one of your songs. Is that okay? I said, sure. And he showed me some of his other work because I wanted to see what type of stuff he does. I was blown away by his work as well. And then he, he really had to go because he had no money. He had to really find work. So um, I understood. And he said, man, I know another guy. He's fantastic. I'll send these tracks to him. And you can continue there. So great. Met that person by accident. And uh, we ended up having an amazing connection. And he came up with so much ideas. It was insane. And slowly but surely, it's built to something. And now we have a good friendship. Yeah, it's nice. As you say, or, uh, accidents. <laughs> yeah. So I started asking people to ask the artist questions. Okay, Luke. Hi. I got one question for you, and it's okay. not someone you know. So it turns out, first off, it's not someone you know. Someone I know. So I was like, okay, this is this is cool, right? So people are actually starting to engage with this because I'm only trialing it. So I, I, I'm learning as we go as well, which is brilliant. Of course, yeah, it's a big step. Um, so the question actually, when I heard it, I thought that was a really interesting question because I never would have thought about asking it. Okay, cool. So the question was, tell me about the photo that went along with the single release. Where was it taken and why did you choose that as your release photo? That's an interesting question and it's a very good question, actually. Um, that photo was from two years ago and I wrote the song and recorded it two years ago. It was a long time ago I recorded in, in that song, but it was all about when was the right time to release it. And um, the person that took that photo was a very good friend of mine. She's a, she's a, like very Scots girl, like you know, freedom and all this here, you know. She's uh, she's a lovely girl. I and uh, I, I've known her for a long time, and she really liked my music, and she really uh, really supports everything I do. It's it's like back and forth. I support her what she does, and she supports what I do. She was like, "Mom, was going to take photos in Edinburgh." I said, "Okay, great." So we went to this fighting, I just outside the Edinburgh Castle, and it was like cold outside, and it was frosty on the fighting. This really beautiful fighting, it was gorgeous, and uh, the sunlight was coming from one direction. And she took a couple of shots, and she said, "What do you think?" And I had we look at them, and I was just like, "That's." that might work with this song it's got that warmth coming in in the sunlight and there's the frost on the on the fountain and for the name cold and dry i thought that really captures it and i think when i was singing and playing at the fountain i was really in that element of the song so it really captures what way i was feeling when i was writing it and performing that song and i think uh when i put that picture up online i was like i, I couldn't think of a better one to fit it. I don't want to make it cliche or cheesy. I want it to just be in the moment. I think it's very important to capture that. And I was inspired by a lot of photos when I see that. Like I really like Jeff Buckley's uh, photos because when he's sign and play, you could see it in his face, you know, and you could see he meant it when he was singing. And uh, I really like that about him. Like I love his song called Lover, You Should Have Come Over. Ah, oh, it's a beautiful song. And you could tell when he sings it and when you see the recordings and even pictures when he's in the studio doing it. I was like, he's really in his element. And at the time when I was at the fight, I was in my element and I thought, perfect. That's a perfect shot for, for the for the single. Yeah. And I'm even more happy you reached out with that really interesting question because I wasn't expecting something that complex as an answer. But when I think about it now in a realistic manner, of course, you're going to put as much thought into what you're going to use to embody the song that you created so maybe i should ask that like far said, more regular 
Do you know? Like, it makes perfect sense that that image should have a story that ties along to a song that you're going to use it for, for the foreseeable. Like, I don't know why something like that, like, didn't occur to me as an important question to ask. Yeah. Prior to... That's a great question. That's a very, very good question. I really right. like that. Yeah, I love it too. Uh, so thank you very much, Ash, for sending in that question. Thank you. Um, before I let you go, I just want to ask the last question. We could have time for like loads of these, right? But let's let's condense the last two questions into making one. Okay. I'd like you to recommend local artists that you think I should keep an eye on. And I would also like you to recommend local venues or venues that you would like to remind everyone to go and support once they reopen. Okay. Um, if I was going to pick uh artists to check out one of them at the moment is funny enough a good friend of mine and she is from scotland and uh, she's 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 unreal she has stuff on spotify her name is elsa and but her artist name is elsa and the seahorses and she's from edinburgh but she lives in berlin at the moment and she just released a new song called i think old moon it's fantastic but one of my personal favorite songs of hers is a song called The Center of Everything. And she recorded it years back and she um, has CDs and um, it's on Spotify. I think it's on Bandcamp and SoundCloud. And she's called uh, Elsa and the Seahorses. I, I really like her. She's got this kind of like relaxing, atmospheric. It's not super slow. It's like folkish, chill, atmospheric, psychedelic vibe. And so her stuff and I really she has a beautiful voice. It's very soft and airy, like very whispery, but it works so well with what she's doing. Uh, yeah, highly recommend her. She's very active and she's still working away in her music. That'd be one artist I would definitely recommend to check out. Another one uh, I met in, in, in Edinburgh as well, but he lived in the Netherlands and I know him from the Netherlands as well. He's an American man. I think he's from Texas. <laughs> Texas. And he's, uh, he's very blues rock. He really likes his gospel Johnny Cash, like bump and clap kind of stuff. And he calls himself Chris Fantastic. And he has the church, the church of Fantastic. And it's spelled with a fan, like B A N. And then Tastic is T A I S K. I see, I think. Yeah. And um, yeah, he's like rockish, bluesy, gospel loving. And I met him at this venue called the Dog House. And he's like, You want to do an open mic with me? And I said, Sure. And he played his songs. And I was just like, Wow, he's got that bluesy rock. And at the time, I was doing blues rock. So then I played some too. And he was just like, Oh, man, oh, man, oh, man, we, oh, yeah, connecting all his ear stuff. And uh, I just thought, Yes, he's got that fuel. For the fire and I, I, I we both brought it to that stage and he really shows every grit and gut of his stuff so I recommend him Chris fantastic definitely um, so fan news was the other one right I'll name one since I mentioned Scotland quite a lot <laughs> uh, I recommend Stramash is one if you're a local in Scotland or if you're going to travel you want to see some really good music um, really I mean, really amazing artists, Stramash in the Cowgate area in, in Edinburgh is one uh, I really loved. Um, and for me, there's quite a lot I, I like here actually in Germany when they were open. Um, there's one I really liked called uh, Tonelli's and it's in Leipzig. And when the lockdown happened, the venue was so good with artists so good with artists um that they stayed open till the very end and they still paid all the artists like um original music as well um, and people are very generous people know to come down just to hear artists they know it's the place where uh, original music is going to be so so many people come down just to go and check that out and they were sitting eat food or uh, have drinks and watch the arts on stage. And they are very generous with uh, trying to support the creative arts. So sometimes you would get so much tip money as well. It's crazy, just from original music. And I really love that with Tonelli's. 
Um, I try to think there's a lot of places in the Netherlands. Um, I have to say Amsterdam is, is fantastic for original music. I went to the, funny enough, I played in the train station in Amsterdam and it's just the train station in Amsterdam, that's all it's called. And um, in there, they give you a circle stage. And there's two televisions and it's got pictures of you on it, which is a little cliche, but it's just to say who you are in these big words, Luke Watterson, artist, you know, blah, blah, blah. Uh, playing at this time, even when you're on. And you have this carpet. It kind of looks like the setup to the Nirvana Unplugged. It's a circle and there's carpet, the very 90s looking thing with the candles and stuff and lights. They didn't put light candles on that day, but they put lights on. And uh, they filmed the whole thing. And it's in the center of the station and people stop by and they just circle you like you're like some type of sculpture. And they just check you and go, hmm, hmm. I like his guitar strap. That's nice. Yeah, hmm, hmm, hmm. And there's like little kids and stuff dancing and like, mommy, mommy, music. You know, it's great. I love it. So I think Amsterdam is a very good spot, definitely for original music. And I met so many songwriters through there all around the world. Um, so the train station in Amsterdam is definitely one. Uh, Stramash, Scotland, Edinburgh. And what was the other one I said? Uh, to Nelly's Leipzig for uh, original music. It's, they're really supportive. I, I would say there's three venues that I've experienced. The last few years are the the best ones I've been to. Mm -hmm. That's all wonderful information. Thank it's you so much. It's a lot to take in, I'm sure, for you. Don't worry about it. I'm so about sorry. It. I Don't worry you. about it. <laughs> no, I've had, a dinner. <laughs> <laughs> I've had a wonderful conversation with you, and I look really genuinely like forward to when tiny little ghost is going to come out and just to see like the complete polarity between what you've already done and what's about to happen you know? i'm really excited for it too because um i think a lot of people are and they're going to expect it now but they're also not going to expect what's coming out and we have an animated video hopefully coming out for it for halloween as well and i'm going to do an acoustic uh, session of the song as well so there's going to be the rock band psychedelic version and there's going to be an acoustic version and an animated video, hopefully, as well. Wow. Yes. Busy, busy. It's great, though. I'm, I'm actually yes. so, so happy. Um, yeah. So for anyone who's watched this interview on Luke's side, my own name is Rebecca Cappuccini, and I have been running these podcasts since the first week in lockdown. There's over 80 of them available on my YouTube channel. Please go find them, subscribe. There's so many interesting articles and people there. It's very cool. Uh, for anyone who's watching on my side, this is Luke Watterson. He has just released a song at the end of last year and it would be a shame for you to miss out on that. So that's called Cold and Dry and you heard everything you need to know about this incredible man in this interview. So we're gonna stop recording now.